this morning, both here and online. It is uh, a privilege for us to uh, worship here together. There's a lot of uh, talk of freedom in our country and in our world. We have people in, in our presence and in our past who were not allowed to worship on a Sunday morning, who were not allowed to gather as Christians. We should thank the Lord and thank him for placing us in this place, for being able to freely worship and praise the Lord. I'd like to uh, read a call to worship. Mighty God, you welcome us into your kingdom as honored guests. You give us water to wash our feet. You give us a kiss of greeting, and we anoint our heads with oil. Merciful God, you welcome us even though we are sinners. You forgive our debts and give us a seat at your table. Wondrous God, we have come here to give you our worship and praise. May we make a joyful noise at your table. If you would bow with me as we have our opening prayer. Giver of the most expensive gift of all, help us to learn from you. May we, who are so adept at catering for our own wants, make ourselves more vulnerable to the needs of others. Let us live unselfishly and more sensitive, sensitively that we may spread love's fragrance wherever the odor of cynicism and despair hangs in the air. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. It's nice to see you all this morning. Uh, we have a couple songs to sing together. We'll invite you to uh, stand if you'd like to, to join us, or remain seated, whatever you're most comfortable with.
next one is a new one, so you can feel free to uh, stay standing or take a seat. Please join with me as we have a prayer of adoration and confession. On the screen up front here, you'll see my part is in white and your congregation part, I think, is a different color. Yes, it is. So please feel free to come in at that time. God, our Father, creator of all, in these few moments of worship, we come to you with words and works, the desires and hopes and fears that dominate our everyday lives. We want to give you thanks in all things, to seek new perspective, to find new strength. 
Jesus Christ, Son of God, help us today to find our hearts burning with a fiery love and a devotion to you so that, kneeling at your feet, we can hear the tender whisper of your call. Holy Spirit, wind of God, open our minds to learn from Christ that in listening we might hear and in hearing we might respond as he invites us to come and die and to live. We come to give thanks in all things, to seek new perspective, to find new strength. Eternal God, creator, redeemer, and comforter, hear us as we confess our wrongdoings. Often we wear ourselves down with the pretense of righteousness. Today, we throw off this attempt, simply admitting our failure to live in the way of Christ. Amen. There is a rumor there's a children's story today. I think our famous storyteller is going to come from somewhere. I'm not sure where, but he is here. I invite him to come forward. So we have to check with Mr. Chapman, and I think you can all hear me, but maybe too much. <laughs> Xander, the commander, wow, he's growing almost as tall as I am now. <laughs> well, oh boy, I was thinking about this, and the trouble is, you know why I really come up to tell this story? I'll tell you why I can take this thing off. I can, right? Uh, Step back. I might have to put it back on because I will need volunteers. Should I move it? Okay. Yeah, so I was thinking about the story and it's really, uh, Christmas isn't far away and everybody got gifts, right? You remember the gifts you had? Kind of. Do you still play with them? Oh, you do? Okay. Well, there are many good gifts, but there's some very important gifts, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But also, we want to get to another topic, words. Words, <laughs> really quite important. You like to read? Do you like new words? I have a new one for you. It's called olfactory. Do you know? Hmm. I'll give you a clue. Olfactory. It has to do with smell. And, uh... Any of you have dogs at home? Dogs. Yes. Well, dogs are amazing. I really love dogs because dogs really appreciate smell. They just define the sense of olfactory. We had a dog once, and if we opened the window in the summer, it would do everything, and it would look out the window, not with its eyes, it was with its nose, it would, mm, and then it would really deeply breathe in when we went past, can anyone guess? Cow patties. Oh my. It would stick its nose out and close its eyes. And I think if there was ever a perfume that dogs would make, what would rank very high would be cow patties. And it's a good thing they don't because uh, they might share it with us. Okay. Oh, speaking, we have smells here. Does anybody want to do a smell test? I'll put my mask on. Hmm. I want you to guess. Any volunteers? I'm going to bring it to you. Okay. What do we have here? Hmm. Okay. Ah, there we go. A little bit of a smell. What do you think? Is it pleasant? Hmm. Not sure. Hmm. Oh. You want to try? Any guesses? Oh, rather pleasant. Another one. Deep. What kind of one is it? Tell me. Kind of. Actually, yeah, kind of like it's kind of perfumish. No, what else do we have here? Okay, one, just two more, because we're running out of time here. Oh, there's a chip. Mmm. That one's pretty 
good. What else do we have here? Oh boy, this is one of my favorites. Take a smell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I won't share with the rest of you, but I'll tell you what it is. No, when you grow older, it may become your favorite. It's garbage. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another one. Now, would you like to smell this one? There we go. Oh, not so good. It's not so bad. You can give me a Mr. Janice and try this one. lesson in church today. But smell can be a gift. And we were talking about gifts as Christmas. But the passage that is going to be talked about today in church from the book of Luke is about a beautiful gift. But it was so simple because in Jesus' time there was a lady and she was hated. And she had led a sinful life. But no one would show her love and forgiveness. And that is what she needed. The greatest gift. All the gifts you got at Christmas, all the things you can hold, really are meaningless. The greatest gifts you have, right, are your friends, your parents, I mean, you're my age, children and grandchildren, aunts and uncles. If you have a roof over your head and something to eat, you need little more in the way of things that you can hold. This lady went through the crowd and struggled to get to Jesus and she was pushed away and discouraged from going. And all she had was beautiful hair and a beautiful bottle of perfume. And it was the greatest gift she could give. And so she put beautiful fragrant perfume on her hair and she washed Jesus' feet. And Jesus looked, the greatest love. And it was a gift you really couldn't hold. The gift of love is the most powerful gift that we can receive. And we receive it here and we celebrate it in this church. And I am a gift with you because on my birthday I received the gift of love from my son. And he called me and he said, I will play any music you like, Dad. And I send it to you. So him and his friend played a piece of music and I play it over and over and it's just an old hymn and I love it so much. I can't hold it, but I can share it. So thank you for the gift of
Thanks, Bill. That song was way better than whatever was in that jar. <laughs> uh. <laughs> For scripture this morning, I'd like to read Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in the town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, and that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love is shown. But whoever has been given little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Andrew, if you'd like to come forward. Oh, no, let's sing first. Sorry. We'll invite you to stand and sing with us or remain seated, whichever, whichever you'd prefer us to.
Our second reading this morning is uh, called Gospel Reflection. Because we have preserved our joy in mana jars for the long winter of despair, storing them in the dark corners of our souls, we have forgotten its gritty taste. Because we have put a tight lid on our joy and put it in the back of the pantry, we have forgotten how it can tickle our noses. Because we are so busy prattling, pious platitudes about the poor, the least, the lost. We ignore your words which anoint them as your children. Because we have put up with the shutters and storm doors to keep your future from sneaking in, we have missed the sweet breeze carrying your hope to us. Because we are who we are, restore us, holy God, and make us a fragrant offering to the world. Andrew, now I'm ready for you. As Andrew comes up, let's pray for him. Lord, we ask you to give us ears, ears for the word that Andrew has for us this morning. Be with him. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So this passage from Luke 7. What does it mean to invite Jesus in for dinner? The setting of this passage is essentially an ancient dinner party, in my opinion. We have the three main characters, Simon the Pharisee, Jesus, and the sinful woman. It's a bit of an uncomfortable dinner, it seems like, not the kind of party I would want to go to. First off, we've got a judgmental and, and unworthy host. Quickly followed by that, we have the uninvited, sinful interloper. And then finally, we've got a a bit of a contentious guest of honor in Jesus. With the parables, though, and and this this passage is a bit of a parable in itself with one tucked in between. Um, We've got the the person who's forgiven much, the sinful woman. The the person who's forgiven a little, uh, Simon the Pharisee. And then we've got the creditor, who, who is Jesus. But with all of the parables, I think one of the interesting, interesting things that we can ask is who are we in the story? Who are we meant to be? Who does Jesus want us to be? And who are we right now? So I think what we'll do first is we're going to talk about each of these different characters in, their, in order, I guess. So the first is Simon the Pharisee. And really, as far as backstory goes, that's all we know about this man who invited Jesus to dinner. He was a Pharisee, and his name was Simon. There's no other backstory. We aren't told anything more about his life, but all we know is that he invites Jesus, a man who continually and often came into conflict with his sect, into his home for a meal. And interestingly enough, Jesus accepts. Throughout the Gospels, um, feasts, food, and nourishment are key themes in Jesus' ministry. Stories like the feeding of the 5,000 in Luke 9, 
Um, the story of the rich fool who stored his surplus food instead of sharing it in Luke 12. Uh, the parable of a different rich man um, and Lazarus in Luke, Luke 16. And then parables like the great blank banquet in Luke 14 where he, uh, this king invites the poor and the needy uh, into his meal. Um, and then there's other stories in other gospels as well, like Jesus turning the water into wine in John. And there are so, so many more. Um, it's clear throughout the Gospels that sharing a meal at the table is a connection to being a part of God's kingdom. Jesus' consistent work with food in some way also forces us, I think, to see lots of interesting implications for how we look at food, um, how we are provided for, and seeing how we are nourished by God. We don't have time really to go into all of those things, um, but I just want to highlight that first part. Sharing a table with God is almost always part and parcel with sharing a portion of God's kingdom. Um, but it's interesting here, as in there's other parts in Luke as well, but here Jesus shares his table with a Pharisee. So what else can we learn about Simon? First off, he, he clearly isn't all that interested in helping those that he thinks are less fortunate than him. Verse 39 in Luke, Luke 7 says, Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So Simon clearly judges the woman who washes Jesus. Uh, it's clear from that little excerpt that he would never let such a person come near him, let alone wash him. Simon, it seems, thinks that someone like the sinful woman is not only beneath him in dignity, but they would tarnish his goodness if he let them get too close. Next, we also know uh, from the story that Simon is not nearly as good as he thinks he is. Verses 44 through 47 see, uh, where Jesus is kind of rebuking Simon, he says, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she's loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. So Simon seems to think he's so much above this woman, but he's completely, completely failed to be a hospitable host. And instead of fixing his mistake, instead of trying to catch up after he's um, seen this uninvited sinful woman doing the job of a host for him, he decides to insult Jesus further by questioning his status as a prophet. This kind of harkens back to me the idea that uh, where Jesus is talking in Luke 11, um, he says that the Pharisees clean the outside of their cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and wickedness. Ceremony is a good thing when it brings us closer to God, but it's not a good thing on its own. And here, uh, Simon has made it clear that he doesn't seem to understand this. He thinks that if he can just go through all of the rites, go through all the rituals, he's a good person, but he's failed as a host. The final thing I think we can learn about Simon is that he's not as far gone as we might think. It's clear that he's kind of the antagonist of this story, but notice that when Jesus tells us that the, sin, um, the sinful woman will love more for being forgiven more, he doesn't tell Simon that he doesn't love God at all. Verse 40 says, Jesus uh, answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed the 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will I owe or will, I, will love more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus answered, you have judged rightly. So Simon does call Jesus teacher. Um, Simon is clearly meant to be the debtor that's forgiven little, but he is still forgiven. He does still love, though it is little. He still shares a place at Jesus' table, but Christ's made it clear that the sinful woman is greater in his eyes. Jesus doesn't kick Simon out of the kingdom, but he makes it clear that Simon, the way he is, is less faith faithful and less a servant of God's kingdom than this woman. Jesus simply switches their place in the hierarchy of the kingdom. Simon may be the antagonist of this passage. Um, he may insult Jesus and show that he's completely unworthy and I think partly unready to accept Jesus' kingdom but he still has a chance. 
I think um, he has his foot in the door in a way, but by the end of the passage, we don't really know if he's going to go further in or back his way out. We just don't know what kind of effect this dinner had on him. The second character uh, in this story um, is the sinful woman. And if we know very little about Simon, I think we know even just as, le- as little about the, the sinful woman. In John's version of the anointing and washing story, um, that the parallels throughout the other Gospels, um, this woman is Mary, sister of Martha, um, who does the washing. In Mark and Matthew's Gospels, she's simply named a woman. Only in Luke is she described as sinful, and only in Luke does she weep. In each of, uh, each of the other Gospels, uh, the woman is chastised by others for wasting money by anointing Jesus' head with this oil. But in Luke, instead, she's judged for her status as sinful. We also know that this woman was not invited to the dinner. She hears about it secondhand. She isn't invited to the table, um, but she goes anyway. In Matthew and Mark, dinner's held at the home of Simon the leper. And in each of those cases, it's not really clear whether the woman was invited or not. But here, the the tension is a bit more potent in Luke. A woman, who is a sinner, interrupts a meal that she wasn't invited to, Verse 37 says that she heard where Jesus was dining and then went there afterwards. And this meal isn't just anywhere. It's the home of one of the religious purists of her time. A woman who's only, only described as sinful is going into the home of a Pharisee. What's interesting about the Pharisees is that Jesus never really accuses them about not caring or not being zealous enough for God. He often invites them to see clearer, to know better, He calls them out and corrects their errors, but he never critiques um, their devotion. They were in every way dedicated to their faith. They were just too self-righteous to see that they were wrong. So this sinful woman took the risk of going somewhere she was sure to be judged. And she was right, Simon was not too kind to her. But her risk-taking doesn't end there. She debases herself, she weeps, she uses her tears to wash and her hair to dry. She risks embarrassment and judgment in order to give something to God. She doesn't seem to think that she's worthy to sit at the table, so she sits at Jesus' feet instead. She had no business being there. She wasn't a servant in Simon's house. Um, So likely everyone there other than Jesus was astonished to see her. But still, she weeps, she washes, she anoints, and she loves. She goes to the extreme for Christ, and shows the quality of her heart, even if the Pharisees and everyone else can only see what's outside. So this woman is completely committed, I think, to serving, and because of her commitment, Jesus tells her in front of a crowd of Pharisees, the most judgmental people of their time, that her sins are forgiven. Her bad reputation, her history, are wiped clean because of her devotion and love. And in the end, though she didn't think she deserved a seat at the table, Jesus invites her in, He forgives her sin and tells her that her faith has saved her. She may not have been able to eat at Simon's table, but she sits at the feast of the kingdom of God. The final character in this story is Jesus, and I think he makes himself to be a bit of a difficult dinner guest. Despite the obvious flaws that we see in Simon, I think Jesus here isn't the ideal dinner guest at all, especially not in Simon's view. Jesus is certainly unafraid of conflict. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand that by doing a little bit of background, background work here. So in the Old Testament um, Judaism, laws were handed down to keep the people clean or holy. Things like pl- proper hand washing and hygiene were really important ways that God's people were meant to keep themselves apart as the chosen ones. So in Leviticus, we see laws regarding pretty mundane things like cleaning up mildew, um, washing after uh, being infected with a skin disease in chapter 14. We have regulations for which foods were clean and unclean in chapter 11. We have rituals for purification after childbirth in chapter 12. Um, And the list goes on. These were all laws that were meant to cleanse dirtiness or unholiness out of the people. Because for them, coming into contact with these sorts of things would spread the dirtiness or uncleanliness. It was a contagious problem. So for anyone to enter God's presence then, uh, be that at the temple or at the tabernacle before, they had to be completely washed clean. Otherwise, there was the chance that they could taint the holiness inside. This is why I think only the high priest was allowed inside um, 
the inner sanctum of the temple and only once a year. They had to kind of protect holiness by making sure that they didn't bring anything unclean inside. And so before Jesus and his teaching, cleanliness and holiness were things which could be corrupted by coming into contact with the unclean. But in this story, instead of dirtying Jesus, as tradition should tell us this sinful woman ought to, the story tells us that by touching him, by washing him, the opposite happens, and she is made clean. Jesus is the source of holiness, and that's the paradigm shift here. We aren't uh, sullied by touching the unclean. Jesus shows us that his holiness is infectious, not the other way around. And so that's why I think Jesus spends his time with the sinners and tax collectors, and why after calling Levi, the tax collector, to follow and be his disciple, after the Pharisees asked why he spends his time with such distasteful people, he reminds or he responds to them and says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So no wonder the Pharisees were so judgmental and concerned and offended by all the things that Jesus did. It's because they thought that his interactions with these people made him unclean as well. And so from, from this first perspective of holiness, um, we can kind of understand Simon's position a bit better. He invited Jesus into his home, but with Jesus comes this sinful, unclean woman who goes about washing his guest in a completely and traditionally unclean way. So Jesus, by drawing her here with the rumor of his presence and allowing her to touch and wash him, has in Simon's eyes become clean, or become unclean, sorry. To Simon and the Pharisees, the sinful woman's uh, uncleanliness is contagious. And so it's no surprise that he can't help but point out her faults and question Jesus' holiness. I think to some extent we can all, all sympathize with Simon, whether we want to or, or not. This sort of thing would be really uncomfortable and awkward and challenging. Um, it's not so unrealistic to think that we might make a side comment like Simon does. Jesus here is kind of the one acting abnormally. And yet we're called to love like him. And so further than bringing this riffraff into Simon's home, Jesus goes on and insults him, saying this, that this woman has been a better host, that she loves God more, that she's in a higher, uh, higher place in the kingdom of heaven than he is. Jesus places this sinner above Simon and humbles him. He's unafraid to critique Simon's judgment. He's unafraid to defend those without power or influence or wealth or even a good reputation like this woman. Instead, Jesus sees to the heart of this sinful woman and is unafraid to defend her and uplift her. By the end of this passage, she's not sinful anymore. So Simon questions Jesus' status as a prophet in verse 39. But then Jesus, I think, we've shown here, goes about and does exactly what the prophets were supposed to do. He sees to the heart of the matter, past tradition and culture, past the society, um, he sees to the heart of this woman and then stands up for her. He stands up for the socially marginalized and impoverished, even if that means offending or risking consequences or changing traditions. This was the type of job uh, that the prophets were supposed to do to speak truth and confront the rulers and people of Israel and Judah when they failed to follow God's commandments. And Jesus here is doing the same sort of thing for Simon. So now that we, we kind of have these three characters in our minds, I wonder which of the three we most identify with. Which of the three comes closest to home for us? The beauty of Christ's parables, of the stories in the gospel, I think, is that we can find ourselves in any and all of these, these roles, depending on where our lives take us. We can be the creditor, or we can be the lesser debtor, or the one forgiven much. In different seasons, we might find ourselves in, in the role of any or all of these different people. And thankfully, I think that we can learn from all three. Simon shows us our flaws that we can't see. He teaches us that we might be wrong, that we need to be able to, be, to learn to be wrong. He teaches us not to judge too quickly, to value a person's heart over their appearance or history. And I confess this is something that I struggle with often. I, I find myself identifying with Simon maybe most often than, than the others in this story. I'm a nurse in the hospital, uh, for those of you that don't know, and we often have patients that come to us from the streets or, or who are addicted to substance abuse um, or, or just people who come to us at their worst. No one likes being sick. Um, every time I get a cold, I get bugged that it's a man cold and it makes you so grumpy. But all of us, all of us get that, I think, where when our bodies don't play the way that we want them to, when they don't do what we want them to, it, it affects the way that we act. And so 
I, I think that when I see these impoverished, weak, and needy patients, most often those are the ones that treat me the worst, that treat the other nurses on the floor the worst. The names that I've been called, the things I've been told I can go do, the, the threats that I've received, um, these almost always come most often from exactly the sort of people that Simon would call sinful. And it's hard to love them, I think. It's, it's hard to recognize that their addictions, their fears of being vulnerable, their lack of security in their lives, these are a large part of what makes them aggressive or harsh or hurtful or angry. And like Simon, I think I need to be reminded that these are also children of God. I need to be reminded that those who suffer much um, and are forgiven will love more. I need to learn to put aside my pride and my arrogance and love like Jesus would call me to. But like Simon, I know that Jesus doesn't just kick us out of the kingdom for our failings. Jesus wants to just put us in our place, make us faithful under God without our pride trying to make us feel better by looking down on others. And so Simon shows us essentially what not to do. But the sinful woman, on the other hand, gives us the perfect example, I think, of what it means to live for Jesus. She's willing to humble herself, humiliate herself, and risk the consequences of her faithfulness in order to please God. She weeps, I think, because she knows that she isn't enough. She knows that she needs to be forgiven. And so she comes to Jesus, serves with everything that she has, and weeps knowing that, God, knowing that she needs God to make her whole and to forgive her because she can't earn it on her own. I think I'm far less often like this woman than I am like Simon, but this story is, is a reminder that we can do it. If a known sinner can show up at the most judgmental home uninvited, lay down and, and prostrate herself in service to God, I think that so can we in some ways. All of us need forgiveness. All of us need to be forgiven much like this woman does. But we need to learn to recognize it like she does. This passage, I think, encourage us, encourages us to ask if we can shamelessly serve God like she did. It asks us if we're willing to take risks for God. Finally, uh, the third character in this story is Jesus, who kind of serves as the antithesis of Simon. Where Simon judges and pushes away, Jesus loves and accepts and forgives. He isn't afraid to offend Simon or traditions or culture. And I think it encourages us to ask if we're forgiving, if we show love to the needy and the outcast and the dirty or unclean. How often are we like Jesus in this story? Are we willing to, to speak truth and critique those who oppress and judge? Are we willing to be a source uh, to spread God's holiness through our association with the unworthy or sinful? In my Bible study group a few weeks ago, during one of our discussions, um, one of the other members said that um, he would avoid spending time with non-Christians because he didn't want to be influenced by them negatively. And in the back of my mind, I couldn't help but think how wrong that was. If Jesus had avoided those more sinful than him, or if he had just never let anyone come close to him, we'd never have heard of him or his saving grace. Because anyone who would be more more holy than Jesus, or as holy as Jesus, doesn't exist on earth. And so like Jesus, we're called to mix with our society. We're, we're called to mix with the world, because only by doing that and being in it can we show Jesus' love to people. Like he said uh, to the Pharisees after calling Levi, it's the sick who need a doctor. In this specific situation, before I said anything, um, my girlfriend spoke up and mentioned exactly that sort of thing, that spending time with, with people who aren't Christian is a great way to show them God's love. And I think that this is the, the sort of prophetic thing, in a smaller way, that Jesus did here with Simon. Taking a risk to voice truth, uh, to, to defend those without a voice, um, even if it might mean offending others. And so I think um, this passage in Luke encourages us that wherever we are, whomever we identify with in these, these three, Whichever of them seems most like us today, God is with us, helping us. Even judgmental, failing Simon still has hope, is still a part of God's kingdom. Whether we, we need to be reminded of our failures to judge less and love more, or we need encouragement to give, all of our, or give our all in shameless service to Christ and others, or if we find ourselves in positions to call out injustice and evil and show the world how we ought to live, even when it's uncomfortable or rude, 
we are all people of God and he is still with us. Whether we are Simon or the sinner or the prophet, uh, let us all pray and try to become more and more a part of God's kingdom to share a table with him in the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's sing one more song together. Feel free to stand. Please bow with me for the benediction. Loving God, how lavishly you pour out the costly gift of your grace upon us. Fill our homes, 
and our lives with the fragrance of your love. So that we may show your glory and serve your people through Jesus Christ our Lord.